Okay guys, I've had multiple requests to do some videos on Jordan Peterson. I am familiar with Jordan Peterson's um, just, I don't know. I'm familiar with Jordan Peterson. I've, I'm familiar with the things that he talks about, the way that he thinks. I do agree with much of what he says. And I came across this. Now this, this upload is dated October. So a few weeks ago, but I don't know if this was recently recorded or not. But anyway, I came across this and it seemed like something that would be quite interesting because it deals with things that are, are, are interesting to me, which, well, with regard to stories, okay? So the title of this is, Why Do We Enjoy Watching Antiheroes? And I have just watched a little short film before this about the boys and was talking about Carl Butcher's, Carl Butcher, oh my gosh, Carl Urban's character Butcher being an anti-hero and how it kind of tied in with what I was getting ready to watch. So I already sort of intuitively know why I enjoy watching anti-heroes. And it's probably very, very much the same reason why a lot of other people enjoy watching them. But I'm curious to find out how he's going to break this down because he always explains things in a really interesting and thought-provoking way. He kind of takes these complex situations and he breaks them down into these, um, into a language or into a way of explaining it that makes it to where you're like, oh yeah, that just makes perfect sense. You know, it's just so simple to understand. So let's see what he has to say on the subject of anti-heroes. Well, part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous. And then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel mm -hmm. is better than not being able to be cruel. Because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous, mm -hmm. but you have it under Strain. control. Right. And you know, exactly. a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to avoid. be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. Right, right. But if you happen to have to get in one, and, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. And so the strength that you develop in your monstrousness is actually the best guarantee of peace. And that's partly why Jung believed that it was necessary for people to integrate their shadow. Strength and he said people. that was a terrible thing for people to attempt because the human shadow, <clears throat> which is all those things about yourself that you don't want to realize, reaches all the way to hell. And what he meant by that was, it's through an analysis of your own shadow that you can come to understand why other people are capable, and you as well, of the sorts of terrible atrocities that characterized, let's say, the 20th century. And with oh yeah, for sure, um, absolutely. I mean, honestly, if this year hasn't been demonstration enough that humans, even humans who supposedly live in nice civilized societies, if this year hasn't been d demonstration enough of how absolutely repugnant some humans can be and how quickly they can turn on their fellow humans and very easily view them as lesser and therefore worthy of stomping on, well, figuratively and literally, um, that has been demonstrated 
so clearly this year, you guys. I mean, it, it's been, and there, you know, through the the um, the whole COVID thing and all of the snitching that's been going on when people see somebody doing something. Oh, so I see two people holding hands. I see somebody visiting this person at their home. Stuff like that, which happened. I mean, my my brother's a nine one one dispatcher. And he called it the snitch line. And he's been assigned to the snitch line a few times. And some of the things people are calling 911 about to rat on other people about is now see, I use the word rat in a in a in a negative with a negative connotation. I love my ratties and rats are awesome. I'm using it in the context of you know what I'm talking about, like to betray other people or to stab other people in the back. That is, that is not a smear on my sweet little ratties. They are wonderful little creatures. Humans are not necessarily so wonderful sometimes. But, you know, the sort of things that, that people are capable of doing to their fellow human being because they view them as, as what is going on up there? <laughs> because they view them as someone that is well, let's say whether evil or less than human. And so therefore it, it, it dehumanizes them in the eyes of the person doing this thing and makes it easier for them to do whatever it is they do to somebody that they don't like or to think really bad things about them, to think practically that they're literally the devil, pretty much. Uh, so that kind of ties in a little bit with the point he was making. I mean, maybe not completely, but that's what it made me think about when I heard him say that. Analysis of your own shadow that you can come to understand why other people are capable, and you as well, of the sorts of terrible atrocities that characterized, let's say, the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And without that understanding, there's no possibility of breaking. I mean, honestly, if we think here in our country or or any other sort of, like I said, first world or civilized country, that we're not capable of becoming some of the most vile type of people similar to people in other countries that have done very, very bad, bad things. This year demonstrated that we are quite capable of that. So that's, I guess that's kind of the point I was trying to make earlier bringing it under control. When you study Nazi Germany, for example, or you study the Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin, and you're asking yourself, well, what are these perpetrators like? Forget about the victims. Let's talk about the perpetrators. The answer is they're just like you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that, that just means that you don't know anything about people, including yourself. And then it also means that you have to discover why they're just like you. And believe me, that's no picnic. So that's enough to traumatize people, and that's partly why they don't do it. And it's also partly why the path to enlightenment and wisdom is seldom trod upon, because if it was all a matter of following your bliss and doing what made you happy, then everyone in the world would be a paragon of wisdom. But it's not that at all. It's, the, it's a matter of facing the thing you least want to face. And everyone has that old... There's this old story in King Arthur where the knights go off to look for the Holy Grail which is either the cup that Christ drank out of at the Last Supper or the cup into which the blood that gushed from his side was poured when he was crucified. The stories vary, but it's it's basically a a holy object like the phoenix in some sense that's representation, a representation of transformation. So it's a it's an ideal. And so King Arthur's knights who sit at a round table because they're all roughly equal go off to find the most valuable thing and they and where do you look for the most valuable thing when you don't know where it is well each of the knights looks at the forest surrounding the castle and enters the forest at the point that looks darkest to him and that's a good thing to understand because the gateway to wisdom and the gateway to the development of personality which is exactly the same thing is precisely through the porthole portal that you do not want to climb through. And the reason for that is actually quite technical. This is a Jungian presupposition too, is that, well, there's a bunch of things about you that are underdeveloped, and a lot of those things are because there's things you've avoided looking at because you don't want to look at them, and there's parts of you you've avoided developing because 
it's hard for you to develop those parts. And so it's, it's by virtual necessity that what you need is where you don't want to look because that's where you've kept it. And so, and that's why there's, you know, an idiosyncratic element of it for everyone. Your particular place of enlightenment and terror is not going to be the same as yours, right. except that they're both places of enlightenment and terror. So they're equivalent at one level of analysis and, and different at another. So anyways, back to fiction and, 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 and what it does, it, it distills truth and it, it, it produces characters that are composites. And the more they become composites, the more they approximate a mythological character. And so they become more and more universally true and more and more approximating religious deities. But the problem with that is they become more and more distant from individual experience. And so mm. with literature, there's this very tight line where you need to make the character more than merely human, but not so much of a god that, yeah. you know, one of the things that happened to Superman in the 1980s, Superman nice. started out, he's got a heavenly set of parents, but by the way, and an earthly set of parents, and he's an orphan like Harry Potter, very common theme, is that when Superman first emerged, he could only jump over buildings, you know, and right. maybe he could stop a locomotive. But mm -hmm. by the time the 1980s rolled around, like he could Why? juggle planets and, you know, swallow hydrogen bombs mm. and, you know, he could do anything. Well, yeah. people stopped buying the Super. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Well, okay, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why Superman has never really been my favorite comic book superhero characters because to me, he's always felt like for the most part in general he's he's always felt like he's just way too overpowered and that made him a boring character to me like there was no real darkness or depth or or you know complexity to his character for the most part until um uh, when when they brought henry cavill out as Superman and actually Brandon Ruth did a pretty decent job um, in the part as as far as I was concerned I liked his portrayal but I like Henry Cavill's portrayal better because he does bring um, Zack Snyder brought a darkness to Superman that made him this dangerous you know complex type of individual and it made him more interesting so I like that incarnation of, of Superman, but, you know, kind of ties into his point of when a, when a character is so over and above, just ridiculously over and above and just overpowered, that makes them not really an interesting character. It's, I, I call them Mary Sue's. I mean, this maybe doesn't, maybe Superman doesn't fit the actual technical definition of a Mary Sue, but... To me, he kind of does because he was just so overpowered. He was kind of just boring and uninteresting to me. Anyway, okay, here we go. Follow hydrogen bombs and, you know, he could do anything. Well, people stopped buying the Superman comics because how interesting is that? It's like something horrible happens and Superman deals with it. Mm -hmm. and, and something else horrible happens and Superman deals with it. And it's like, that's dull. He turned into such an archetype. He was basically the omniscient, omnipresent, um, om omnipotent God. And that's no fun. It's like God wins and then God wins again. And then again, God wins. And, you know, so then they had to weaken him in different ways with kryptonite, you know, so green kryptonite kind of made him sick and red kryptonite, I think, kind of mutated him, if I remember correctly. And anyways, they had to introduce flaws into his character so that there right. could be some damn plot. Mm -hmm. And that's something to think about, you know. There's a deep existential lesson in that, in that your being is limited and, and flawed and, and fragile. Um, you're like the genie, which is genius in the little tiny, in the little tiny uh, lamp, you know, this immense potential, but constrained in this tiny little living space, as Robin Williams said when he played the genie in Aladdin. But the fact that you have limitations means that the plot of your life is the overcoming of those limitations right. and that Conflict. if you didn't have limitations well there wouldn't be a plot and maybe there would be no life and so mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why perhaps you have to accept the fact that you're flawed and insufficient and and live with it and consider it a precondition for being 
it's at least a reasonable it's a reasonable idea so anyways one of the main characters is the country the known the explored territory we went over that a bit and it always has two elements i mean your country is your greatest friend and your worst enemy you know because <laughs> it squashes you into conformity mm. and demands that you act in a certain manner and reduces your individuality to that element that's tolerated by everyone else and it it constrains your potential in a single direction and so it's really tyrannical but at the same time it provides you with a, a place to be and all of the benefits that have accrued as a result of the actions of your ancestors and all the other people that you're associated with so there's the good tyrant or the bad tyrant and the good king and those are archetypal figures and that's because they're always true and they're always true simultaneously you know which is partly why i object to the notion of the patriarchy because it's a myth law it's the it's the what do you call that it's the apprehension of a mythological trope which is that of the evil tyrant mm -hmm. without any appreciation for the fact that the archetype actually has two parts and the other part is the wise king and you know you can tell an evil tyrant story about culture no problem but it's one sided and and that's very dangerous because you don't want to forget all the good things that you have while you're criticizing all the ways that things are in error oh. that's a lack of gratitude and it's a lack of wisdom and it's it's founded in resentment and it's it's very dangerous uh, both personally and socially okay so yeah he he covered a lot of stuff in here and he's such a deep thinker and he just goes from one thing to the next to the next to the next and he's got such a rapid train of thought or a rapid way of explaining where he's coming from that I sometimes I have to kind of I, I'm really just I I wasn't saying a whole lot during this I, yeah there were a few times that I would stop and say something but I wasn't making too much commentary during the course of his little lecture here because I was really focused on trying to absorb everything he was saying and completely get everything he was saying. And I'm not, I'm not as much of a deep thinker as um, someone like Jordan Peterson, which is why I appreciate his ability to take these, th this sort of subject matter and to break it down into these little... Uh, parts that really make a lot of sense like it so w when he brought up the thing about you know the patriarchy and why he rejects that sort of narrative and i do too for the same exact reason that he well pretty much i mean there's different reasons why but for the same exact re like rejecting the par patriarchy as far as the narrative of the patriarchy because you know when someone comes out and uses that word that is code word for feminism generally, um, a lot of times militant feminism. And I find it very disturbing and I find it also very destructive and divisive and demeaning. And just, I, I find no real positive thing to attach to that terminology, that label, because it's weaponized. It's used as a weapon against men and also as a weapon in society. And, but he explained exactly why it's not a good thing to be holding up that argument because it's like you're taking, all you're focusing on and all you're seeing is the bad things about whatever this, but then you are ignoring all the good things that are also attached to that. It's like you, you're demonizing men and you're completely disregarding and annoy, annoying, ignoring. Um, yeah, you are annoying when you do that. <laughs> you are ignoring the good that is attached to that. And we're not all like people in general, a lot of societies in general, most issues, not all, most issues are not starkly black and white in nature. They just aren't. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of complexity. And so, you know, just kind of trying to separate and split things into black or white, that causes a lot of friction and problems in just in, in, in general um, between people. 
within society. I mean, this year has demonstrated that pretty clearly. The past few years have demonstrated that very clearly. And it's, it's, it's problematic and it leads to so much conflict and so much anger and hate and just nothing really constructive much at all comes from it. And I, I appreciate his ability to sort of very logically, concisely, you know, calmly explain why certain things aren't helpful, why they are fundamentally a negative force, um, but he's able to explain it in a way that is very calm and he's not yelling at or screaming at or anything. He's just explaining this is why. And I appreciate that he's able to do that. And, you know, about some of the things he talks about, or just some of the things that anyone like him talks about, that they are able to sort of express what a lot of times I already intuitively feel and know, but yet I don't know the words to express it. And they're able to take things, someone like him, or like so also Thomas Sowell is, is someone who, who comes to my mind right in this moment. There might be somebody else, but I can't, I can't think of it, think of who it is, but um, that they're able to take certain um, arguments or, or they're able to make certain points that are like the way I'm thinking, but I don't know exactly the, uh, the most effective way to explain it, in other words. So uh, that's what I, I appreciate about someone like Jordan Peterson. And, you know, uh, this was interesting. It went in a direction I wasn't anticipating. But um, yeah, I'm glad I checked it out because it was about, you know, it's about stories and characters. And that's, you know, one of the main, that's one of the main um things that I focus on for this channel, entertainment stuff and what makes a good story, what makes an interesting character and things like that. But, um, so yeah, I figured it'd be kind of, it it would tie into sort of the theme of the channel to check this out. And I'm glad I did. And I don't know if I made any sense explaining, um, what I've been trying to explain, but I feel like he certainly did a really good job of, of laying out his thoughts very clearly. And, um, if you guys haven't seen him yet in this particular little um, clip, hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I did. So, okay, well, it's getting on up there and I've got to go watch an anime show with my son. So I'm going to sign off now, you guys. Hasta luego. Mm-hmm.